you know, and, and what motivated the change was everybody was wrong but me. I was right. I was always right. Yeah. And then I come to find out, like, as I, as I started to have this, like, what am I doing wrong here? And I started to find out just, I guess I should say I started to realize and it became clear that I was the common denominator in all of these problems. Welcome to It's Just Bodybuilding. Another episode here. We got, of course, our producer, Scott McNally, Dusty Hanshaw, myself, Ron Parlow, and back on the show. Second time on, right? Not third. Second. 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 We got Tony Mandris on. Good to have you, man. Great to be here. Great to be here. You know, your first episode was a lot of fun, and uh, we got good feedback on it. And it was also kind of one of our our first, I think Tony was one of our first kind of um, not typical guests as well. Yeah, like you know, we were kind of all the you know bodybuilders on, and then we had you on. It was really a cool change. So I enjoyed talking football with you uh, back that last time too. Yeah, that was a couple of years now. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 We're still here. Yeah, <laughs> so am I. <laughs> and we've been through a lot. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Remember to like, share, subscribe, comment, and ring the bell. Ring the bell. Yes. And remember, Mutant sponsors the show. Of course, Mutant and I, Mutant and Dusty, you know the connection. So everybody go to IamMutant.com and use the code BIGRON20 or DUSTY20 for 20% off. And we don't mind if you alternate and take turns. Well, I have links to that in the description. Yeah, links in the description. Scott's on the ball. And, of course, (laughs) we have to say you can support the entire Think Big Bodybuilding Network by clicking on the Patreon link that is also in the description. And uh, and that helps um, Scott with the entire Think Big Network. So it all the other shows. Yeah, what are the other shows? Give them the other shows. Drugs and stuff. Oh, I, I, uh, it, blood, put, blood yeah, sweat, and gear. Exactly. And what, Muscle Minds with Scott muscle Stevenson. Minds. Plus, we've got a bunch of cool other little shows that I'm putting out. I have one um, with Dr. Mike Militech, who's out of here uh, in Michigan. He is a um, he works with like uh, neuropsychology or neuro- neuropsychiatry. And he, we're going to talk about dopamine. I already recorded it. It's just not out oh, yet. So, Ron, you'll like that go. one. A lot about I love dopamine. the dopamine talk, yeah. you know, the motivation uh, chemical. Yes. So, okay. <laughs> okay. So, Tony, I, I actually jumped in late. You guys were already chatting, having a laugh. Yeah. I come yeah. on and everyone's laughing. And I'm like, oh, we were shit. Talking about, we were talking about you. Yeah. <laughs> of course. <laughs> no, it's all good. So, Tony, what's new? Well... Uh, since the last I watched it, since two years ago, there's really just kind of been, you know, you take two, two, three steps ahead, one step back, two, three steps ahead, one step back. And it's like, you know, what's going on here? Just, and, and talking more or less in a general sense, just with what's going on in society yeah, is to put yeah, it yeah. nicely. Yeah. Um, Every, everyone had their everyone had their journey of through the last couple of oh years. Oh my gosh! And it's been it's been. Uh, I mean, I you know I I went from posting on Instagram probably once or twice a day about whatever I'm doing, whether it's behind the scenes of a, of a photo shoot or whether it's working out. It doesn't matter what it was, or you know, going up to Sedona or traveling, whatever. Yeah. And I just got so disgusted with all the stuff on social media that I just got disinterested, even though I wasn't posting about societal stuff or whatever we want to call it right i was just so disgusted by it i was like you know i don't even i'm not even motivated to post mm-hmm. you know it's probably good and, for um, your mental health you know get probably, away from it, that. Yeah. i think it was i think it was it was good to kind of and, and it was interesting because you know you catch yourself sometimes after dinner and then you go check your instagram you check this check that before you know it it's like nine o'clock and it's like geez i just spent like an hour and a half two hours on my social medias yeah, and yeah. when you start eliminating that and start just, I don't want to say like I sat there and meditated. I didn't do that, <laughs> I, but just kind of even just reading a book mm-hmm. or rereading a book or, and I'll tell you, this was hard was to force myself to watch a show or to force myself to watch. You know, if 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 there's a movie, a certain kind of movie that I'm into, like you know, just like three hundred, the movie three hundred or you know, sci-fi or thriller, you know, I'll watch it, but it's like I was pulling up movies I hadn't watched in years, right? 
Right. Like I watched Rocky again. The Let's original the Rocky. Right? Yeah. Yeah. Ro- yeah. I mean, that was Rocky and Pumping Iron were the two movies that made me buy gray sweats and a gray hoodie and start jogging. <laughs> There you go. <laughs> those, those two movies, and uh, awesome. you know, it was, it, it was, you know, and I would sit there and watch that, and then like an hour and a half would go by like that when when you're watching something you love. But I would make myself watch something different. Think you know, try to think, and I'm like, I'm always in the back of my mind is like, what am I gonna learn from this? Like, what am I gonna get? I'm always like looking for how am I going to better my game or put more tools in the toolbox? And I was like, for once, stop and just fucking don't learn anything. Just enjoy it. Right. Right. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) And it's, it's difficult. I found it very difficult. And because I was like, I'm I'm not moving forward right now. Do you think there's an attention? Is there an attention span thing? You mean like as well from like, so how social media has affected us. It's just a challenge to sit and watch a movie. I think think we've all experienced that. Yeah, we've all experienced it to different degrees. And I think, uh, I mean, you know, we were lucky. I think we're all old enough to be or or that we were around when the Internet really wasn't around. Oh, yeah. And at least I was. And and, uh, (laughs) it was like it was different, right? It was like, yeah, I remember living in Michigan in Upper Michigan near Traverse City. And I'd go, you know, I would go make sure the salt lake was good for the deer in the back of the, you know, (laughs) forest on the farm we lived in and were put out feed for for, you know, corn for when we're baiting deer. I don't know if you can still do that. Um. If you if you can, that's what we used to do. It, I think they do. Right? I think yeah. they do. Still on your own property and stuff. Yeah, right? yeah. yep, on my own property. Yep. So, and then before you know it, it's like you're spending a lot of your time outside. Yeah, right. And now looking at all that time, it's and it doesn't mean that people still don't do that, but it's just like I you find yourself, and I don't feel like I like like that I'm like hooked on my phone. Like I got to be on my phone. I, but I there was a time where I was like. If I didn't have an internet connection, or if I was in an area that didn't have like a signal, I'd be pissed. Yeah, yeah. right. I know that feeling. And it's like, right, you, know, right? <laughs> <laughs> you know, and it's kind of like you know, just this kind of somebody telling you just a way to kind of unplug. Huh. For a bit. Yeah, for sure. You know, for sure. Get back to the fun. You know, my big thing that I've always gone back to is, and this is, I don't know why it's been like this my whole life, but it's always go back to fundamentals. Mm-hmm. Doesn't matter what it is, just things aren't working. Go back to fundamentals. Keep it simple. What's the most important thing? Why are you irritated? You know, it's like, did you get enough sleep? Did you eat? Are you hungry? Did you eat? Because right. those two things, like those two things alone, solve ninety percent of my problems. Huh. Yeah, yeah, I know what you mean. <laughs> you know? It's like if I if I've gotten enough sleep, and for me, the sweet spot is between six and seven hours. Huh. Right. And and if I'm not, you know, starving, I like I don't do the eating regimen that you guys do or the, you know, schedule uh, anymore, but there's times where I'll go like till 3 p.m. that I haven't eaten since dinner from the day before. So then I'll in my head I'll be like, "Well, I was just fasting for like a short fast." You know, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Like, well, it's cool now. It's cool now to right, miss right. me. Right. thing. Right? Yeah, yeah, that's it. And I want to be in with the in people. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Actually, I want to do the well, you're, you're looking lean and trim too. Looks like you're staying in shape. Like, what do you, what are you doing? Look at that. Hey, <laughs> how how heavy were you when you played in the NFL? Um, like, like the best weight for me was like about three fifteen to play okay. at. Uh, I played at three twenty five, and it was too much. Right. Jeez. You got just because of the running. It's it's yeah. constantly and, and, running. And what do you weigh now? I was uh, 271 on the scale yesterday. Oh, okay. you're still a big dude. But I get, yeah, you're, you're tall. A monster. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah <laughs> like, I don't, I mean, I'm not by any means. Like, when, you know, it's like, you, again, you compare yourself. I compare a monster, no, I'm a skinny, no, no, tall, but you, old guy. You, you, you walk into a room, you walk into a room, and you're like, oh, yeah, yeah guy, I was a liar. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. It's Makes funny sense. to just watch people go, man, you're tall, and you're like, 
I, I guess I am. You know, I guess I am tall compared to a lot of the people that aren't six six or six five. Yeah. <laughs> but, yeah. but the, the, you know, it's funny to hear you say, you know, I'm still a monster at two seventy. It's like it's a different two seventy than I was even you know ten years oh, ago. Oh yeah, <laughs> sure. Yeah. Not sure. that I'm out of shape, but it's like it's like I'm working out like twice a week. It's like what's that I'm working out? <laughs> what's the average size? What's the average size now of that same position? It's probably that weight, three twenty five. Like I was, I would consider. You were kind of was, ahead of your time. You're uh, yeah, a big guy. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. But there was guys shortly after my time where now everybody yeah. was my like that size or bigger. Yeah. Like the one, the one guy that was really, in my opinion, that was an incredible player, a very impressive and you know, player, and just like off the charts strength was Larry Allen from Dallas uh, Cowboys. Now, if you looked at his body, you'd be like, you know, I don't want to have a body like that. He was a <laughs> hunk of mass. I mean, he was yeah, huge. Yeah, yeah, And he was strong as heck. He benched over six. Yeah. Like, I think well over six. Squatted, I think, in the sevens or eights. Deadlifted, like, sevens yeah. or eights. And, like, and this for is a back player, in the 80s. Yeah. Nah, ni- I would say 90s. 90s and yeah. the 2000s. But I'll tell you what, he was like, yeah, I mean, you could tell he's just a big guy, right? He's yeah, and, this, and, and, so, and so fast and skilled at that size, too. Just unbelievable. Like, I've yeah. seen him, like, run in a, there's a famous clip of him running down an interception that it's just like, is that massive humanity moving that fast? It's, <laughs> really? it, was very, it, was, it was very impressive, I will say. I will definitely say. Um, I never met the guy, but man, it's like one of those guys that sticks out in your mind. And then, of course, you have the guys that from prior to my career, like the the Websters from Pittsburgh, and and just that whole crew from the Steelers that won all the Super Bowls in the late seventies. Who? When? When did we start seeing three hundred pound linemen? Was that in the seventies? No, eighties. I I would say it was in the eighties and nineties. And now it's like, you know, you're... Yeah. Uh, well, if you're not 300 pounds, you don't get drafted, right? Pretty, yeah. <laughs> like, They'll take the best athletes, like, regardless. Yeah. But yeah. they're pretty much... There's just... There's such a pool, like, talent pool of, of selecting. It's ridiculous. It's... Like, there's guys that are... Like, I never thought that you'd have a, like, a lineman, offensive lineman, that is, run a faster 40 than I ran at, at like a combine. Mm-hmm. And so that day that I ran, I was 308 and ran a 464. Now, that being said, to this that day... makes no sense. Yeah. Well, yeah, it's, it, there's a lot of inertia there, right? And it's... To this day, there hasn't been an offensive lineman to run it faster. Hmm. But they don't count mine because I ran it at Michigan State when I had my own combine. So when I went to the Indianapolis combine, I did my physical and everything. and basically gave myself six more weeks to prepare for the combine, you know, and right. talk. And, 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 you know, I had been working with the track coach for, you know, six months to a year to, and I'm like, I just need to run a fast 40 yeah. and I need to know what's going to help me. And plus it gave me six extra weeks to make sure that everything was out of my system. <laughs> Check this like picture crea- out. Creatine and stuff, you know. Yeah, Check obviously. This picture yeah. Out, guys. <laughs> like that's a lot of mass yeah. to be moving that at was, that speed. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> yeah, that was the day. That was the same day. That was a, during a shuttle. That picture was during like a. I think it was called a 15 yard shuttle. Okay. Um, but that's the same day that I ran that four six at 308. Dang. Yeah, so, that's just freaking yeah. awesome. Yeah, that's you like don't a, look like Larry Allen there. Yeah, that's I what think. I was gonna <laughs> say. <laughs> There's no comparison to Larry Allen there. You know what's bonkers, yeah. Tony? Is since I since I moved to the South, you know, you're not allowed to not watch college football. They will murder you, <laughs> right? Um, it's, it's a different culture. And so now it's it's ingrained in me. Like literally, this is what you do and what you talk about. But what's baffling now that I'm in it is seeing, like you said, the talent pool. It's ridiculous. Like Georgia lost 15 players to the NFL last season, and then they're number one this season. Like, how do you lose that many players? (laughs) And they're actually, I think this year's team would beat last year's team. 
crazy. Like the depth and same thing. Like they have players that, you know, because I, I follow them religiously now. They'll pull out their, you know, their best player in a position that puts someone else in. It looks like the same guy. Yeah. Yeah. You're like, well, oh, you know, so when he good, goes this year, yeah. the next guy's going to just walk <laughs> right in. I mean, and that expectation you know. and that standard is set right. for the guy that's back. It's like you guys, when you guys were up and coming and you got to lift with guys that were already pros, you know, and right. already at the top of their game, you guys were like, whoa, like this is a different standard of right. lifting. Like they're, dem- like they're demanding on themselves. So you guys implement that. To your yeah. own, you know, lifting and, and nutrition and everything. So, you, I mean, it's kind of like you always had what it took. Now you know what it takes to right. get to that level. And, um, you know, to, to be extraordinary or you have to lift extraordinarily and you have to eat extraordinarily. You have to do everything above and beyond what status quo is. Right. That's cool. Yeah. So are you awesome watching? See. Oh, go ahead, go ahead. Scott. Oh, I was just going to say, so I know one of the things we wanted to talk about with you today was recovery. And, you know, I look at that picture. I see this guy here. I'll bring that same picture back up. And I heard, I heard you were like a scary dude back then. I'm just thinking to myself, the Tony that we're talking to now, he seems like a very different man. And I know because I know recovery myself, I know a lot of where that comes from. Um, you know, and, and that was kind of one of the big things we wanted to chat about with you today is, you know, how did you get where you are today? Cause I mean, I don't know about you, but for me, uh, I, I wouldn't be here right now. We wouldn't be recording this show no, if, if it I wasn't sure for be. me getting, you know, out of drug use and, and not only that, but into recovery, being able to like change a lot of things at the core, not just the right. abstinence, you know? Right. Yeah. I, I had, um, you know, the biggest motivator for me uh, then and what made me change, um, and, and and this motivator is still the biggest motivator today, is pain, hmm. that emotional pain, especially the emotional physical pain. What are you going to do, die? Big deal, right? It's like we can all deal with physical pain, but it's that it's that emotional pain that when it becomes overwhelming, um, you're like, maybe it's just a bad week. And then those bad weeks turn into bad months and those bad months turn into bad years. And then hmm. thank God I never had to go a bad decade, but it almost felt like <laughs> from 89 to, to 95 were really bad because, you know, and, and what motivated the change was, Everybody was wrong, but me. I was right. I was always right. Yeah. And then I come to find out, like as I as I started to have this, like, what am I doing wrong here? And I started to find out. Just, I guess I should say, I started to realize, and it became clear that I was the common denominator in all of these problems that were happening to me. Right, so I got to the yeah. <laughs> so I got to the point where I was like, okay, well, maybe I should see what role I'm playing in this. No and kidding. it doesn't matter. It could be with wife. It could be with business. It could be with anything. Yeah. What role mm-hmm. am I playing, and why is there so much resistance constantly? Mm-hmm. So look at my. Uh, maybe I'll look at my stuff and see what's going on here, and. And I, I could see my part, even though in my head at the end, you know, I was still foggy right before I, I, I went into the treatment center, um, I was clear enough to feel that emotional pain and and I was tired of it. I was yeah. tired of it. I was I was basically willing to do, at that point I was willing to do anything. I w- my plan was, you know, I got pretty much kicked out of the league in 92 and mm-hmm. my plan was, um, cause it, it had been three years and then I got sober, and my, and then my plan was, if I work at the as a, <laughs> I didn't actually think this part, but if I would have worked at Walmart as a Walmart greeter, I would have been grateful. Yeah, like mm-hmm. I would have been because I would have been employable again, hmm. not employable in the NFL, just employable. I was at the point where I couldn't hold a job because I wasn't responsible enough to show up. 
whether wow. it's Seven Eleven or, or Circle K, and and there's nothing wrong with those jobs. But I wasn't even capable of being responsible enough to show up for a job like that, you know, in those last two and a half years of drinking and drugging. Yeah, yeah, but I can, then, I can know, relate to that. That's rough, man. It's a yeah, yeah. Do you do you remember what the last that like? Because I I remember personally. I remember I remember hurting my girlfriend. And I really cared about her. And I remember feeling like, oh, shit, like I really hurt this person. And I felt really bad about it to me. Then that opened it up. And I was like in my family, I'd always thought like, yeah, you know, this is I'm doing my own thing. The only person that could be hurt out of this is myself. But I don't care about that. You know, I can take that. Do you remember like that, that kind of thing where where, where that trigger was? Yeah, Yeah, there was. There was. So I got sober March 23rd of 95. And that Christmas, three months prior, it was like maybe the week right before Christmas Day, um, we were living in uh, this huge log home in northern Michigan, not the UP, but Maple City, just outside of Traverse City. That's oh, where we okay. had the farm. Yeah. That's where we fed, fed the deer and put the salt licks out. <laughs> but, <laughs> um, <laughs> but I remember, basically, long story short, my, my wife had made steak. And she, she she knows I don't like it like blood like bleeding red, but I mm-hmm. like it like medium, right? We're talking just little semantic details here. Yeah. But this is how on edge I was. And I liked to eat in front on the sitting on the couch by the coffee table watching the big screen. And she and we were already bickering about something, I couldn't tell you what it was, but she kind of like tossed the plate. Didn't throw, she didn't really throw it, but she didn't set it down nicely. And she kind of tossed it onto the coffee table. The coffee table had some glass on it, so it made a loud noise. It didn't break anything. And I cut into it, and this thing's like bleeding like it was alive an hour ago, right? So, and it's just like, you know, that, you know that tipping point, the white yeah. light mm-hmm. tipping point? So that happened. Um, and it's like I once once that happens, like I know it's coming, like I can just feel it, yeah. and I know mm-hmm. it's coming. And usually, I you know there was a time where I could be like, okay, don't just don't go there, just walk out, do whatever. So I took that plate and and like a baseball pitcher, I threw it up against the fireplace, mm. and the fire with this huge fireplace in this in the living room, and it was like a like. 28 feet to the middle pitch and it was all like beautiful field stone and a big huge log home and i smashed that i mean i threw it hard and that plate broke up into you know 20 pieces and the steak went flying and at the time i had a golden retriever and he just beeline for that steak, <laughs> of course right? he did so, yeah. boy. <laughs> so in, the, in the middle of the chaos uh, i have this moment of kind of like l- internal laughter Right. And I see this, my dog's like chomping away and he's like, holy smokes. Like, yeah, I don't know what the noise was, but there's a steak on the ground. <laughs> and I kind of like chuckled inside and I turned around and there was my three-year-old daughter shaking. Oh, yeah. So like literally you're talking like a instant of a half a second, you go from this you know, there's a little bit of humor there watching the dog. You turn around, your daughter's sitting there shaking and her eyes are all watery. And this kid's scared to death. Yeah. It's like, it, it, you know, if you put yourself, you know, and, and it's, a, it's a girl, not that that really, I don't think at three years old matters. Mm-hmm. Um, at three years old, if they're older, I think, you know, you start to get into some more stuff where girls are affected differently than boys. But she was shaken and she was scared to death and i put myself in her shoes and i was like like she's watching a monster yeah she's watching an out of control human being um that has no tools on how to cope with life skills Hmm. but i and i but i did have tools it's just that i had forgot them and they eroded and they got numb with all the alcohol and and opiates sure and Mm -hmm. so that was like the moment where I had that deep down inside core feeling of something has to change. And I know what it mm-hmm. is. It's, it's me that has to change. Like, mm-hmm. and I knew the problem was the drinking and drugging. I, <clears throat> and that was like the catalyst moment. Um, although I still drank and drugged for another two and a half months. Yeah. Um, 
more things happen, but they didn't get that intense, but just they started happening more and more commonly. But the crazy thing is, and I know that, um, Scott, you'll be able to relate to this, is like, I think you'll be able to relate to this. I, for like the last three years of my drinking and drugging, I knew that was the problem. Yeah. yeah. Like, like, I knew that that was the problem, and that has to be eliminated for me before I could even start to fix anything. Hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, so, yeah, so then, you know, two and a half more months goes by and, and more pain and more emotional pain, and um, the whole world's against me. You know, it's everybody's fault but mine. It's the Packers' fault. It's the media's fault. And, well, today it is the media's fault. But, um, <laughs> valid. 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 <laughs> right. But I hope you guys don't get struck for that. Um, we'll be good. So, I'll, we'll be good. I'll right. screw that up later. Don't worry. Yeah. <laughs> Dusty's got that so, covered. <laughs> so, the, uh, so, yeah, I ended up uh, talking to a buddy of mine who was actually uh, my lifting partner, you know, great guy and he's the one that kind of had to sit down with me and just he didn't say anything profound he just said if you keep doing what you're doing like you're gonna die soon hmm. and he's like you've been out of the league three years and i was like what i was like three years it's only been a year and i like walked up to the calendar on the wall because it's not like you could just pull out your phone and see your calendar or something right right it's like it was the wall calendar with like deer and antlers and stuff yeah yeah. <laughs> and and i'm looking at the year and the date and i'm going holy smokes yeah it's 1995 and <laughs> it's wild. like these like years have been a blur it's like you remember them but they were blurry yeah and mm. and i said you know i said uh, like what, what do i do i tried uh, hundreds of different ways to to get sober and nothing worked that I tried up to that point. So he had asked me if I had ever gone to treatment or tried a 12 step program. And I said, no. And he's like, well, let's at least start in treatment. And ended up going to Brighton, Michigan at Brighton hospital and, uh, for, for the rehab and stayed 17 days. Um, got safely detoxed, I guess you could say, uh, I was taken at, up until that point, those last three months were the heaviest using days ever. Sure. I was averaging probably 80, 90 opiate pills a day and without, you know, with alcohol. Yeah. And nasty combination too. You know, the opiates oh, alone are bad, oh. but people, I know so many people to die in that combo. Yep. You, you add yep. alcohol to it. And then when you got to go to the bathroom, Oh it's yeah. like you're giving birth to a kid, right? It's like, <laughs> yeah. cause you get so constipated from the opiates and That's it's like, wild. well, I'm on day four. I haven't gone to the bathroom yet. And it's like, holy sh- smokes. Right. Holy not sure. But <laughs> yeah. Right. It was, it was, I mean, you, you forget things like that because yeah, you know, but all the garbage and all the stuff that comes with that lifestyle. And basically after the 17 days I got, introduced to a 12 step program, but, uh, you know, got safely detoxed. Um, and, <clears throat> and, and, and I thought, you know, there was a counselor there that said something to the first group session I was allowed in. There was yeah. a group of 10 of us. There was like 30 inpatients. And this counselor lady said, I just, before we start this one hour meeting, I just want to say to everybody, Think about why you're here. And also, as a reminder, I want you to remember that your best plans of building your empires and your life got you in this chair in Brighton, Michigan. It's true. And yeah. I thought to myself, oh, my God, she's right. Yeah. And I, and I thought, I thought, what a pathetic loser I am. I, it's like I hated myself and I felt like a loser. Yeah. But I felt better than I did the week before. <laughs> yeah. You know? Right. So, and it was things that I needed to hear and, and things that were truths. And, um, and I was thinking, you, you know, I remember going into one of the, like, the little, like, chapel area where they would also do lectures. Yep. And, like, you get 40, 50 people in there and they'd bring in a guest lecture. And that guest lecture could be somebody that's in sobriety already or somebody that's like 
um, teaches about recovery or, or getting off of, you know, drugs or alcohol from a you know professional level. Um, and this person had everybody stand up um, during this lecture. And then she said, you know, like the first, you know, 14 people sit down. And then she said, like, so that amount of people percentage wise uh, will not make it more than seven days once they leave here they'll relapse and go back and either to their drug of choice or their drinking or their heroin or cocaine or it doesn't matter what it is. Mm-hmm. And then, and then she sat down another group and she said like that group, they'll make it like six months before they go back out. And she's just talking percentages. Right. Mm-hmm. And then, and I was sitting in the very, very back and it got down to where most of us sat down and she said some people would even make it five years. Hmm. And she's going totally off statistics at that time. Right. And then there was one guy left standing in the back, and she said one guy or one person will not drink the rest or drug the rest of their life if they apply themselves to these tools and these principles. Hmm. And I thought, and so it's like, you know, you're talking one, two percent, right? Right. And the first, I mean, it was like, we talk about lack of balance in our lives, even if we're sober. The first thing that comes into my head is, well, why not me? I'll be that guy that stays sober the rest of his life. Yeah. It's like, why not? I mean, that's just, I think, the way we all think. For sure. It's like, I want to, I don't want to be status quo here sitting down. I want to be the guy that makes it. So that motivated you. Well, it, it, that didn't motivate me as much as the plate throwing and looking at my oh. daughter. Yeah, yeah, but of course, that, of course. That, that was like a great, like, like exercise in realization yeah. of these are facts. Like, yeah, it's, it's a fact that more than half the room once they leave here will not be sober longer than six months. That was like it a ga- shock to me. It gave you, as Dusty would say, it gave you a scoreboard to hmm. look yeah. at. You mm-hmm. now have Perfect a scoreboard. Analogy. Perfect you know, had a scoreboard, and you were like, "I'm keeping my score at zero. <laughs> and I had Mine's no time to move. <laughs> yeah. Mine's not going to move. You know, the other one's going to. Everyone else, right. yeah, it's cool. Yeah. That's cool. Yeah, that's I love that analogy. though because if you if you look at what you had already done, <laughs> you've you've already beaten better odds, or I should say, worse odds than that. And I'm yeah. paying. I'm just talking about playing the NFL. Hmm. Like, yeah. <laughs> those are less yeah, than getting 2%. drafted. You know what I'm saying? So yeah. I, I find that interesting because, Tony, it's it's something – I don't know why, but a lot lately I've been up talking to a lot of people, um, and it might be from the show and just conversations we have about success in anything, yeah. success in sobriety, success in anything. And what's baffling to me is when you have the conversation and you, and you point someone out that you know that's successful. You know, like I'll, I'll use Ron, for example, and, I'm, and so you break down what I consider successful. And then you say, well, you have the same tools, give or take, that Ron has. You can do this. And people literally, unlike you, their immediate thought in that situation was, well, I mean, if only one person can make it, it probably won't be me. Like they go the opposite end of the spectrum, but it amazes me how many people don't understand that I think everyone has that. I mean, mm-hmm. not for football or for bodybuilding, right. but that ability. But if you don't buy into it, you're screwed. Mm-hmm. You know, because had you fallen off again, you still have that in you. You know you can overcome. You can do things that others can't. Right. Um, and that's something that I that I find interesting and kind of want to draw on because I feel like a lot of people that I've spoken to I actually, years ago, I don't, might have told you this or not. I don't know, Tony. But I had a uh, I had an employee that worked for me, and he was a longtime friend. He was a client in the gym. Mm-hmm. And uh, when I owned the stores, at the end of the night, I'd have all my employees um, leave $300 cash in the drawer, take out the difference, call it a day, um, right. and then put that in the deposit bag, good to go. And I came in one morning, and the deposit bag was a mess. I counted the the drawer and it was like two hundred thirteen seventy seven. I mean, it was like so fucking far off. I was like, right. "What is going on here?" So I went back and I watched the video from the night before, and I saw my employee. And this is a Sunday, by the way. So we maybe would do a thousand dollars in sales, 
the whole right. day. So it was nothing. Um, I saw the my employee walk out of the store, walk back in, walk back out, walk back in, walk in with a guy. Now I can see the clock. We're after close. They go back in the back. Hmm. He walks back to the front, locks the door. Then they go into the bathroom. Hmm. Then he comes back up, starts trying to do the drawer. The guy leaves. And I knew he was a recovering addict. Right. So I watched all this happen. He was coming in to close that night. And I was. he came in and I was sitting in the back. I said, hey, come, come back here real quick. And he comes back and he sits down. And I said, so how long have you been doing heroin in my store? Mm. And he just froze. Mm. And he looked at me and I go, well, it looks like I was right. And I said, look, you have two options, um, both of which leave you without a job. One, you leave here and good luck to you. Two, we're still friends and you get in my car and I take you to center now. Mm. And he was like, well, I got to go home. I go, that's not the deal. You either come with me now or see ya. I have your last check. It's right here. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and, he, and he, so he took it and uh, I took him to a center. And I have always said, if anyone has kids, when they're around 12, go sit in a waiting room for an hour. Huh. You'll never do drugs. It yeah. was frightening to sit in there because it hadn't hit him yet you know he was normal i see people shaking i saw i mean you see him in pain like talking to themselves i saw somebody walking in that actually vomited and then while they're vomiting because they leaned forward fell then stayed in it and i'm just watching all this and when you're completely sober when i tell you i drove home and like couldn't even have a conversation for a few hours it was like and that's why yeah. I said, I'm like, okay, this is how you keep someone off drugs. You take yeah. them to something like this because sober, it's scary as hell to yeah. see, yeah. you know. Um, and, and fortunately, this kid did go through the whole thing. Um, it was one. It was free. Wow. It was something that they had in, in Mesa at the time. And I know some of those are big dollars. Big, Brighton's big not dollars. cheap. We like, talked before the show, yeah. I, I, so I didn't get to say. I, I was surprised we both had been to Brighton. Brighton's not cheap. Eminem went to Brighton, as a matter of fact. Right. I don't know if you yeah. knew that. Yeah, you, did. Yeah. <laughs> you guys have a lot Wait, of I thought comments. Brighton was a university. <laughs> the funny now you know what you know so many people that have brighton. been there <laughs> yeah like, oh look at all these famous people who've been to brighton what yeah school <laughs> but what yeah. a school it really produces some some great artists right. um, <laughs> but, yeah. but no it was it was really shocking and i think what what sucked for me in that scenario was so i told you i already knew he was a recovering addict well he had a shoulder surgery and the doctor gave him a bunch of meds, even though he told him he was an addict. Right. Yeah. And that was it. So when we when we finally got to talking, I was like, what happened? You know, because he was basically high at this point, so he could have a conversation right. with me about it. Right. And he just told me straight up. He said, well, I had 300. I went through them. Yeah. They refilled them for me. Yep. I went through them. Then they denied me. Then I went to the street. Yeah. If I can jump in. So I did the exact same thing. I, uh, I got clean, went to Brighton and I got clean then in 2005. And, uh, I, I wasn't in recovery though. I just, I got really focused on bodybuilding and it's one of the reasons I tell people too, like you really have to be careful because bodybuilding is freaking awesome. But for people like me, it can be like I can mess anything up. You know, I can take something like fun that's video games and I can turn it into a, you know, a real bad thing. So bodybuilding became an obsession to me. And for the next two years, I pretty much white knuckled the drug thing and didn't use and I lifted and I put on a lot of muscle and I looked different and I felt different. And people treated me differently too. You know, I felt like I got more respect. And then one day I hurt my back and I wasn't able to train anymore. I hurt my back so bad, in fact, that I had to I had to figure out how am I going to get into my car to drive myself to the hospital because I don't know how I can sit down. Wow. Like it was bad. Wow. Mm-hmm. And when I got there, the guy, you know, the doctor, he looked at me and he was like, oh, you're an athlete. You're a big guy. You're going to need more pain medication than a normal person would. Yeah. And me, 
I honestly, at that time, I was like, well, yeah, I'm not an addict anymore. I am an athlete. I'm a bodybuilder. You can tell by looking at how I look. That's not who I am anymore. And the exact same thing happened. It took me two years before I actually finally then made that decision in 2007 and, and actually got clean and actually got into recovery. So yeah. there was a big change and the change was all, all the, the, the mental side of things, you know, abstinence yeah. isn't just, you know, abstinence isn't just not using, it's, it's not just abstinence. That's, that's the moral right. of my point. Right. Yeah, yeah. Exact same thing. Yeah, the, abs- the abstinence ends up being the easiest part yeah. of the whole thing, because it's the hardest part when you're actually going through it. But once you you're past the withdrawals, and the detoxing and you're not shaking and sweating and going to the bathroom or throwing up or con- constantly then you see i had this this is how naive i was about this whole 12 step thing i thought and, and you know you're talking about you have to change all the you know things too it's not just abstinence i thought once i get cleaned up um you know i'll get out of here and just be like just you know, don't drink and don't drug and just live life. Right. Mm -hmm. And, you know, it's in, in that 17 days there, they introduced me to a 12 step program. I went to a few of the meetings there at the facility and started to realize, Oh, like this is going to require some effort and some like (laughs) daily, (laughs) some daily like grind, you know? And I'm thinking, I'm glad I didn't know that before because that might have prevented me from going in. Huh. Um, right. But man, because I would have been like, it's, it's over. It would be overwhelming. It just yeah, like, yeah, yeah. yeah. You know, just it's the task is too large. And it's like, that's just not usually the vocabulary I would use. It would be like the task is large, but we just got to make a plan on how to get there. Hmm. Um, mm-hmm. We're at that point where, you know, or time in my life that, you know, when I say I was unemployable, I mean, I literally mean it. It's not a metaphor. It's like I was unemployable. I could not, like I could probably go fill out a, a, an application form and get the job, but keeping the job would be a whole different ballgame. And mm-hmm. the, the one thing that you guys will find amusing is uh, on day 16, the last, second last day, I met with a counselor and I told them I was leaving after the day 17 and they doctor had told me that he was going to put AMA on my um, outpatient form, which is against medical advice because they wanted me to stay for 30 days. Hmm. Mm-hmm. And then they, he kind of said, you know, your insurance probably won't cover this now. And I was like, well, I'm paying a thousand bucks a day out of my own pocket. So the insurance doesn't matter because there is no insurance. So right. <laughs> he was like, Oh, he's like, Oh, okay. So, I see this counselor lady who's going to kind of get me set up for when I leave. And she, you know, probably said a lot of the same things that, you know, you had heard Scott and, and, and uh, uh, giving yourself the best chance by preparing certain ways and surrounding yourself with a good foundation and doing certain things. Well, one of the things she had found out was that I had played football at Michigan state that I got drafted, played the NFL and, um, she knew I was like lifting and working out was a a big thing in my life. Now I hadn't hardly been working out those last two and a half years of drinking and drugging. Um, Mm -hmm. So she said, and I'll never forget it because she made it crystal clear. She said, you know, if you got back into some kind of working out, some fitness activities, she's like, and she was clear. She was crystal clear. She was like, that's not going to keep you sober, but it's not going to hurt your sobriety either. She's like, it's just another thing. Cause you're going to feel better about yourself yeah. that you're in better health. And, and that makes total sense. Okay. Mm-hmm. She made, she was clear on, you know, look, it's the program and, and do the, you know, whether it's 12 steps or whatever program that you're doing. So- oh no. Oh no. <clears throat> oh, dusty froze too. I did. Oh shit. Oh no, you're moving now. Tony oh, yeah. froze. I remember he where he was at. He can hang up and call us back. That yeah. works real good if he can hear us. He doesn't know that trick because he hasn't been through just, the ringer like you guys have just, with the hang up and click, call click. back. Let's see. I'll hang up on him. That way he will be forced to call back. There we go. Force good. it. I'm going to turn a couple is. lights on. It got dark in here. All right. <laughs> oh, he's no, back. He's back. Yes. Go ahead. 
All right, I can lighten you up. Whoops, let me there see we if go. I can. And left. There we go. We don't have his camera, though. Hey, Tony, if you can hear me, uh, wait, I'm going to hang up on you again. And then when you reconnect, look at that drop down menu. Oh, there he is again. Let's see if this works. There he is. All right. Hey, all right. We got you. Uh, uh, was it me or? Yeah, it probably was me. I'm not sure, but you you were right in the middle of a great spot, and you were saying that she had said about exercise. Great. So this, she's prepping me to give me the best chance. So once I leave, and she had said because of your history uh, um, of being an athlete and and all these things, she's like it it probably wouldn't hurt to start working out again. Um, Just do some physical fitness, and you know I could tell like she wasn't like a fitness person she was a professional addiction person and mm-hmm. but she she said you know it's going to make you feel better about yourself because you're going to feel healthier and, and and it does make sense she also made it crystal clear that that's not what that's like lifting and doing those things is not what's going to keep me sober what's going to keep me sober is this other program and i i understood that crystal clear but when she referred to the lifting and maybe dabbling into some fitness uh, I heard work out like a maniac six days, seven days a week. <laughs> yeah, of <laughs> course he did. That's what I yeah. heard. That's what I heard. And I was like, yeah, I'm down with that. I can do that. And, and, but but I, you I'm don't sure dabble. This, yeah. Right. No. <laughs> Tony so, Manders doesn't you know, dabble. Yeah. <laughs> no. Yeah. Sometimes in my life I wish that's all I did, you know, but it's like it is right. what it is. And, and the key is to learn the lesson from it. Take but, a picture now and again, so, maybe. Yeah, 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 exactly. So I, I, uh, I literally went was starting to work out six days a week, seven days a week, um, because I, I didn't have a job, and I would um, my day my day was pretty much my first five six months of my sobriety. My day was work out in the morning, uh, and maybe golf nine holes with a buddy of mine who's ends up being like my sponsor in the twelve step mm-hmm. program. So I'm golfing with somebody who's sober and, you know, you, you talk a lot about life and stuff and you, and, and you learn a lot of things when you have on the golf course and, and it was a good experience. And then at night I would go to meetings yeah. and I was getting, right. and all of a sudden I'm getting like, I'm, I'm eating normally and better and I'm getting normal sleep. I'm not passing out and coming to, I'm actually falling asleep and waking up. Right. So, you know, in six months, I was like, you know, starting to do like 275 on Smith Incline. And now when I left treatment, I was 255 pounds. And my like I had a shade of yellow on my skin from the jaundice. Hmm. And, right. I, and, and, you know, the maybe the scariest part is I had this nasty mullet, right, that went halfway up <laughs> my back. <laughs> so I'm walking out of treatment a beat up man. Yeah. Like, emotionally spiritually physically for somebody that was of this big stature and strength right Mm -hmm. so in six months i'm like you know doing 275 for sets of eight and like i'm not taking any drugs yeah i'm not even taking creatine at the time yeah and i'm thinking to myself wow it's like I, i never thought first i never thought i would even attempt that but then i because i started getting stronger and eating well and everything and and i'm 28 years old at the time so definitely not too old you're actually reaching a point where you're really going to be strong in your life right yeah Yeah. right and uh and then i was like well i wonder if i can like how far i can push the strength thing and then like it was like a month later i'm like doing 315 for reps on incline and i'm going Mm -hmm. and then i'm thinking to myself you're such a dumbass. Why did you even do this the gear in the first place in school? Oh, right. in school no kidding. Because you're pretty strong. <laughs> you know? Well, yeah, already. Yeah. And I don't regret doing it, that other stuff at all. Um but it got to the point where at, at eleven months of my recovery, at about at ten months I called my agent and I said, you know what, I think I want to try to come back and play somewhere. If you know somebody would give me a chance, because I pretty much burned all the bridges, mm-hmm. and and I had gotten to within probably 15, 10, 15 percent of my all-time strongest. No on kidding. Nothing. 
totally yeah, clear right. in a year. That's wild. And then, and then my lifting, and then once I, I did my workout, everything for India, they signed me. Then I started working out with the strength coach, and the strength coach was like one of the top 10 strongest guys in the world. Hmm. Mm-hmm. Okay. So we're talking in the mid 90s. And he was one of the few people that could outlift me. Like, not in all exercises mm-hmm. as far as weight. But as far as like out grind me, yeah, like right. to the point where I'm like, you know, you win, right? <laughs> I, I just can't push. I, I can't push any more trucks after supersets of you know, leg press and squats and all this stuff. And um, but he had that mentality. It's like the pain is just pain. Like it'll go away. And, mm-hmm. and uh, but he he got me to the point of I would say within two or three percent of my strongest ever. That's and that's cool. like. No gear, just creatine, and everything else. Good sleep, healthy creatine, life. Creatine, the good, yeah, yeah. Every, oh, yeah. you know, not, not drinking. Yeah. Hey, I got not a question. Drinking, like zero. I got a question for you. So, getting clean and getting sober. Obviously, those were things you knew you needed to do because you couldn't stay the way you were. You didn't want to be the guy who's throwing plates and scaring your kid and stuff. Right. But what were some things that you have gotten out of life now? that you didn't even expect? Because I know those things exist. Yeah, they do. Um, they do. You know, you're, I'll give you the the actual real analogy. It's not an analogy then. It's, this is how the perspective was. You know, 11 years old, I make a decision. I'm in Canada, living in Canada, getting too big for skates. And I'm like watching Buffalo and Detroit play right. on Sundays because we lived in Southern Ontario. And, and those were the two closest pro teams that had, you know, where the TV antennas would reach. And um, I'm like, that's what I want to do when I grow up. And, and that, like, that's what I'm going to do. So I'm going to start preparing at 11. And any major decisions I made were to prepare for that. And my brother, if I was five years older, and he was like, don't, you know, don't lift yet. Just do plyometrics, push-ups, chin-ups, do all that stuff, running, all that stuff that you can. I was involved in soccer for eight years, which I think definitely helped my athletic ability so it's like this is the dream and then the next step is to get so the next step is kind of next major step is to get a scholarship to a u.s school so that happens a lot of you know a lot of work in between like not just working out but moving down to ohio my senior year so i can get exposure all these things so get to michigan state then it's like you know there's that literal hierarchy of become a starter um you know become all big 10 become all american become the best player at your position and uh be the number one player taken in the draft when it's your draft year so Mm -hmm. a lot of those things were fulfilled so think about like the plan is working out perfectly okay so Mm -hmm. i wasn't drafted number one and, and that, to me, I, I still felt it was a success because it came down to a matter of what they needed. Dallas desperately yeah. needed a quarterback. So to me, that's out of my control. There's nothing I can do about that. I didn't win the Outland Trophy for the best lineman in college football. And, I mean, my personal belief is because of, you know, the rumors of steroid use. Mm. And mm-hmm. they weren't going to have, like, this guy who's got all these rumors about steroid use, which were true. Um, to like win this award, so <laughs> I didn't. Right, the guy that won the award, mm-hmm. like, and, and there's nothing against this guy; he, he's a great guy. Um, he got drafted like 274th pick, and right. I got drafted number two. So it was like like <laughs> the blatant like political decisions were pretty blatant. Well, I, I had an attitude of kind of like I really don't care anymore yeah. it's like I know I'm going to what I'm going to do to the people in front of me and then you get to the pros and now you're playing your dream job <laughs> and you get paid seven figures for it and you've got all this attention okay so now this is all set up to your point Scott or your question yeah. so then you have the face plant for four years in Green Bay and three years out of the league and then I have a comeback, which I was lucky to even have the opportunity. So I played sober for three years and then retired because of a shoulder injury. 
So playing, there's a great perspective there of playing just messed up and then playing totally clear eyed and sober. Huge perspective difference. Like you can actually remember the play coming out of the huddle. Yeah. Sober, right? <laughs> it's a good start so, right it's like you're not going is this a run or a pass to the guy beside you and him looking at you all confused right <laughs> so the perspective becomes even greater huh. because as sobriety keeps building and more exposure to sobriety and i'm getting more exposed to sobriety you know you start to grow and, and you don't want to go backwards because you're not going to stay the same so you start to grow and you start to see a bigger purpose and you start to look back at your life. That's when you get to the point where you know you're starting to get old, when you start to reflect back on your life. Mm-hmm. Not my not my four years at Green Bay, because there was when I was in India, I reflected on my four years at Green Bay, but I never said to myself, I'm going to look at my life. Like It's mm-hmm. like I did to a small degree, but now, you know, I'm 56, so in the last, say, six years, maybe even eight years, Maybe mm-hmm. ten last last ten years when I've said, "What's it been all about?" And I look at it this way, and I really do feel very strongly about this. I have great conviction about this. I think that football was really just a platform for me to carry uh, the message of sobriety, or to carry whatever message I want to carry. Hmm. Right. And, and for so for me it's sobriety and it's you know it's about faith you know because mm-hmm. like you know it's like i got if it for me and my, my personal beliefs if it wasn't for god uh, i mean i'm not stupid about what got me sober it was an act of providence it was a miracle it wasn't me because my best thinking and my best everything and i you know had the willpower of a bull just like you can all relate to all this kind of talk but i couldn't i was getting my ass kicked with the drugs and Mm -hmm. alcohol so Mm -hmm. i know that that was a miracle that happened and um so even you know to carry that message of faith of you know believing i don't do it quite like some people do it some people you know i have nothing against tim tebow at all i I look hats off to him but but you know there was at certain times i get tired of hearing about the faith part but i think also to myself you know what that's just him that's the way he is and that's fine because mm-hmm. a lot of the stuff almost all of the stuff he's saying i believe right i'm just saying it in a more toned down matter because i know how much i used to repel from that right you know so as i got older i hope i got wiser and started to see that my the football, which was the dream to, to, to grow up and, and become this player and this, you know, star college player and, and star in the NFL. In the big scheme of things, looking back now, to me, it was only a game mm-hmm. that had a lot of fans and still has a lot of fans and has a lot of, like, great memories and I don't discount those things and I acknowledge them. I, I acknowledge the great successes and I acknowledge the great epic failures that yeah. happened mm-hmm. in my life. So I don't, and I don't regret any of it, but it brought me to a point now where it's like, that was just a platform for more exposure to carry this message. Right. Yeah. Yeah. I kind of feel with our podcast, you know, I don't talk a lot about, I'm not like trying to shove recovery down people's right. throats, but right. I think if the people that listen on a regular basis, they know I'm in recovery right. and, and I hope that they can see, you know, and I have had people tell me that they see hope in that, you know, yeah. I, I will say that I had a lot of problems <laughs> with the God aspect of it. I'm not a really religious person and right. um, that was a big struggle for me. So I do want to tell people out there too, because I, I know I'm, I'm thinking of a, of a 20 year old Scott and I'm with you all the way. And then I'm like, well, shit, I got to be a God person to make this work. And and if you were that guy, I, I will say, and we try not to get, you know, all religious on the show or, you know, to share our beliefs, political, yeah, yeah, all yeah. that stuff. But I'll say that, I, you know, that's not my big thing, but I do believe in a higher power. I believe in a lot of higher powers. And I did. And that to me means that there's things that are greater than me 
out there, forces that are bigger than me. And I had to recognize, yeah, there's a lot of forces. Like if I was in the same room with Dusty Hanshaw, he is a force greater than me. <laughs> that is, literally, that is the truth. That is the truth, you know? I've seen it firsthand. And if I get in a room with, you know, a bunch of people who've got same, uh, you know, similar issues as me and we sit down and talk and I feel better, then that is a power greater than myself too, Absolutely. you know? Well, I, I also am, I have to also insert that I, I'm, uh, I've mentioned before to the guys, but I'm surprised how many people message me and say like, oh, good episode this week uh you know the part where you mentioned this um as a recovering addict hmm. and they'll mention that they're recovering and i'm just like wow there's a lot of like you know i mean it's everyone yeah. in, in every walk of life right so yeah. but i think you know you know a lot of people think the you know oh it's the bodybuilding and fitness podcast you know but but there's a lot of people out there listening that have been through what you're talking about yeah and um and then and then almost everyone else has a family connection at least Absolutely. Oh, we've all been touched in one way or another. You know, like, yeah. I mean, um, my, you know, my family has the, has a history, like it's, it's in everyone's family somehow. And yeah. it's, uh, it's, I, you know, I remember when it used to be something people didn't talk about. You yeah. Know? Like, like right. I remember when it, when it was like, Oh, where, where's so-and-so? Oh, he's uh he's away for a while. Yeah. <laughs> Right, like thirty but days. Now, yeah, yeah. yeah. You know, and, and, <laughs> and I remember like that <laughs> right. happening, and and us not being told. You know, oh, they, they're too young to. You know, don't tell them what's going on. You know, yeah. but I, I, uh, I'm, you know, I'm obviously glad that things have, you know, different, and people are doing this, coming out, and telling their stories, and Scott's yeah. living like openly. You know, uh, you know, talks about it on. You know, how many times has it come up on the podcast? You do, Scott. You know, and you know, yeah, all, all the time, and and I, it's you know, important to me. Because I've had people that were that didn't know, and they're like, "Oh shit, I didn't know you were in recovery. I'm in recovery too. I have a year." Or guys are like, "We've even right. had people when we've talked about it that said like, hey, I went to treatment after listening to that. I know I needed it." So right. I think it's important because it, you know it, there's there's a um, a saying that secrets keep us sick, and I think that mm -hmm. it's important that I don't ever. I don't ever put that behind mm. me. It's not part of my past. It's always going to be part of who I am. Otherwise, I hurt my back. I end up back at the hospital and I say, yeah, I can take that shot. You know, I might need a shot at some point, but it, I, I need to be able to face that knowing who I am, you know? Right. 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 And it's, right. you know, it's, uh, it, you know, I was involved to a degree in the bodybuilding community when I was up and coming. One of my trainers was a very well-known bodybuilder, and he was in that top five of what I would say that was a bodybuilder, but was just crazy strong. And, yeah. and so I got to be surrounded by some people, and I'm talking now way back in the day, like late 90s or mid to late 90s. It's a good era in bodybuilding. It, it was a good era. It really was. And and I was living in, for nine months, I lived in Cali in 1989 and trained with him because I just wanted to be in the same town with him and train with him every day. Um, but in the, in the bodybuilding world back then, at least I can say firsthand, that addiction is rampant in, yeah. in one respect or another with something. Oh, yeah. And then there's, and then like, then there's the multiple, like, uh, just out of control things, whether it, you know, it's, whether it's speed downers, gear, sex, uh, social media, it's like yeah. this person's like got <laughs> every addiction covered and they're like extreme right. in all of them and they might be having success, but it's just a matter of time until mm -hmm. it just comes crumbling down. Cause eventually it does, it can only last and be sustained for so long. Yeah. Um, right, and, and the thing is, it's like when we talk about this, I t like I literally, and it's again not metaphorically, literally talking about for me, this is a life and death thing. Hmm. Like yeah. this, if if I go back out, for me, it's not okay because I might not be, you know, like Scott went back out and got was lucky enough to come back two years later, not because the people wouldn't accept him. He's lucky that he didn't die in those two years. Absolutely. For, for, at his own mm -hmm. hand. You know what I'm saying? So mm -hmm. that's how I've approached it since early sobriety. I sur I've surrounded myself with some guys that were really hardcore old school. And to say that back in the 90s, I'm talking like old school guys that got sober in the 60s. 
Damn. And these guys were like old school, like what their guys taught them. So I'm talking like old school. (laughs) Yeah. Bill W. guys. Right. Bill W. guys and and (laughs) Chuck Chamberlain guys, right? Yeah. And and, uh, so it's like, it's all like they were speaking my language. Fundamentals. Keep it simple. You know, did you, you know, if, if you have a higher power, if you believe in God, or whatever your thing is did you pray today did yeah. you do your reading did you read today something or whatever you read out of or whatever um it was all just fundamental stuff and when i think about it i learned all these things when i was a kid when i was like five years mm-hmm. old and i discounted them because it's like oh it's well i learned that when i was a kid i don't need to really know that but then to my own devices you know i try to get sophisticated and fancy and end up creating a whirlwind of you know, chaos and face plan. I have one more question for you. Would you have been, would you have ended up in the same place had you not had the crazy success you've had? You know, we've, we talked to Josh Storms, uh, football coach, and we were talking about all the pressure that are on the kids. And I mean, like all eyes were on you. By the way, my dad is a big fan. He followed you all along. He says hi. So shout out to my dad. <laughs> <laughs> there were so many eyes on you. Obviously, that created a lot of pressure. You could say like, "Oh yeah, well, he went to drugs. He went to alcohol." Would you? Would you? Ha- would it have been different, or would you still be that same person if you're just a normal guy worked at a shop all your life? Well, I think if you're a normal guy, you wouldn't be in that position <laughs> because you wouldn't think like a normal person would think, right? You would. It's like everything, you know. Even even today like when i say today i mean like currently i think extremely Mm -hmm. and i have to think things through before i do an action not on everything but on a lot of things yeah it's like uh, it's like i can't believe that you know I did a speed test on my browser and the, I'm paying for this speed and, <laughs> and text communications only giving me this speed, the, the gall of those people. I'm going to go down. I'm going to, I'm going to, and it's like, whoa, whoa, yeah, yeah. big guy. It's like, it's like, and this is all happening in my head, right? It's like, just chill. It's only internet speed. And it's like, all you have to do is right. call <laughs> and be nice. You're going to open more doors with sugar and salt, right? Yeah. <laughs> it's like, just, Treat somebody like with respect and, and just say, you know, if you're frustrated, tell them you're frustrated and whatever. Just tell them what the deal is. That's just like a minor detail example. But it's like, yeah, but it'll wind me up where I want to like go through a wall, you yeah. know, and, and I don't stay there. It's like I'll, I'll be there for like five seconds and I'll kind of because, you know, the longer you've got the tools to use, you know, when I say the tools, whatever, you know, thought process, think things through. It's like, is this really, in the big scheme of things, is this really that big a deal? You know, right. am I being slighted? You know, and I'll even think, you know, I think by default, naturally now, when I look, when I have adversity, whether it's minor or big, doesn't matter because it's my adversity, um, I'll think to myself now, the first thought that comes to mind is what role did I play in this adversity? Mm-hmm. And that diffuses me so much from going to the next level. And there's been times right. where I haven't played a role. I haven't played a role in, in that company or that person or those people or whatever the situation may be. I feel like I'm being wronged by them. Well, and I'm not playing any like wrong role. I'm doing all the right things. I'm being transparent. I'm being honest with them. So it's like, okay, well, then now bank that because now you know that in the future with these people. If you don't mm-hmm. want to, if you don't want to be treated that way or, or be whatever, don't associate yourself with those people there you know just you know find a different group to run with or a different company to do you know your services with or whatever the case may be um so that you know and we're talking such sometimes small semantic things but i think you know scott knows that it doesn't matter like i'll say to my you know, if I like my sponsor, if I say, you know, this is stupid, but it's eating, you know, I'll say it's eating my lunch, like it's bugging me. Yeah. Um, and he'll be like, it doesn't matter how small it is, as far as adversity goes, if you're willing to pick up a phone and call me about this, it's something major. Because uh-huh. you're picking up the phone and calling me because it's bothering you. And it could be, well, it didn't dry my car off right in the car wash. 
Yeah, yeah. It's like something totally stupid, that. right? Yeah. Right. I hate that. You know, it's like I just want to start. I want to start flinging people around, right? <laughs> like shammies. And but it's like it, it's been stupid things like that. And, it's, and then there's been major things. But it's it's like if it's bothering me, why is it bothering me? Like, what role did I play in this thing? And and right. like I said, most of the three quarters of the time, I played a role that you know, fed into this, you know, chaos. And a lot of times, so did the other person. A lot of times they didn't. A lot, you know, a lot of times it was just me. So I think it's just being aware, um, uh, you know, looking at checking myself first. And, and you know, this took me, what, a minute to explain. This all happens in my head in five seconds yeah. when I check mm, myself, yeah. check my yeah, motives, yeah. check my thing. You know, so it's not like it's dominated my day, but it's like, why am I so irritated today? Why am I so short with people today? You know, and and yeah. I'll ask myself these questions, and I'll see, like, I'll just reflect on the two hours I've been up so far, or whatever. Like, what has happened? Has anything happened that's bothering me? Or, and a lot of times, I'll just start my day over, right, you know, right then and there. I'll just be like, All right. "That's an important one for me too." Remembering that you can right. start your day over yeah. at any time, at any time, yeah. at any time. So it's, uh, yeah, and it's it's good for sanity and it's good for longevity. I hope and people get. You get to have a second breakfast. Yeah, <laughs> yours is <laughs> always good. Yes. Yes. Nothing wrong with a second breakfast. That's true. awesome. Well, Tony, we we appreciate you jumping on, especially uh, you know on my on the random whims, and and we're hopeful that uh, this is beneficial for a lot of people. Um, as someone who has not experienced addiction in in a way that became harmful, but I think a lot of people can identify in their own ways. You know, mm -hmm. and, yeah. you know, like when I think like your question that you asked at the end, Scott, like my I wanted to answer for Tony. I'm like, no, he, he, he'd still been there. Yeah. Because if you weren't everything you put into football would have went into something else. Yeah, and absolutely. it does go into something else right now. You know, I mean, when you're built that way, I find it interesting. Like for me, when people who think I'm going to call normal or average, I get irritated for them because I'm like, why would you think so little of yourself? You can do so much because you're just wired different so you know we really appreciate you coming on and, and kind of giving us some good info and and also hopefully helping out a lot of people because i do we do speak to a ton of people and like ron said a lot of people contact it's like you know it, it's it's a lot more uh prevalent than than people believe when they're in their you know little little zone of life yeah yeah yeah, yeah. and maybe that one person uh watch this episode I hope. Yeah. Out, I hope. You know? Everybody can well, do it. Everybody can yeah. do it. Yes. They just, they just yeah. got to do it. No well, doubt. thanks, Tony. Thanks for coming on. Tony Mandrich, uh, second time on the show. It's just bodybuilding. Remember, like, share, subscribe, comment, and ring the bell. And there, the gun show. Thanks, Tony. <laughs> thanks, guys. <laughs> great great talk to you. Good to Have meet you. Good to see you again, man. Good to see you. There we go. Boom. Right. I'm in the middle. Ah, I, we're going to fix it. When, we're gonna fix it. when, ah, when was he... <laughs> that was like a total shock ah. to me. We never discussed that. We did. I don't have... It. Where? We did. I don't remember. We talked about oh, we it <laughs> a couple of weeks ago. It was a couple it, of weeks ago. It, wasn't, it was probably like three weeks ago, and it was quick. And I'm yeah. still in the middle, and I don't know if Scott's... I, oh, shit. Can't find, I'm fucking with Dusty. Yeah. <laughs> I, I, can't find, I can't find anything in our chat. I think we just talked about it here. No, mm -hmm. maybe Dusty. Maybe no, you had, just messaged me, dude. Was no, that we had, possible? We had some texting too, so that might have been because what happened, Ron, was I watched a thing. Um, maybe you like just messaged saying, me, and and I immediately was like, "What is Scott's date? Like, how long has he been in sobriety? I didn't know." And then we it was. I think we just texted, and then I said, "We got to do another show because you got to love this." By the way, Ron, I was like, "When's your date?" So it was November what. 20... It's either 28th or 29th. I'm not 100% yeah. positive, but yeah. But then this is the best part. He's not even sure of that, but how about he's not sure of this? He goes, it's been like 14 years. Then like a few hours later, he goes, actually, it's been 15 years. Yeah, I had to do the counting. <laughs> I had to do the counting. <laughs> really? Yeah, 15 years as of just a Didn't few days ago. Didn't even know how long it had been. I started I losing track. One question, Scott. Uh, I don't care if it's on the show or not, but what? how is it different now? I mean, do you actually think about it still? Or only if you got to be cautious. Like, I mean, 15 years, it seems to me like 
I don't know how that works, but it seems like, yeah, you're not that you're ever like, you could never just go, you know, load up on some pain pills, but like, yeah, it's so, not like a temptation walking down the road right now. No, it's not a temptation, work? but I don't, I don't put myself into, there's a saying, if you go to the barbershop often enough, you're going to get a haircut. So I stay out right. of places that could cause me trouble. Uh, I don't I need to get out of the fitness industry. Those whores are everywhere. <laughs> like I don't hang oh. out at bars. You know, I, I stay away from bars. Um, e- e- like I don't like make friends that hang out at bars and go there because there right. could be a day that it made more sense. I, I want to keep it a little bit foreign. It's not that if I walked in a bar, I just I'm afraid I'd grab a bottle off of the shelf. But I want to keep right. it a little bit foreign so that when I do go to a restaurant that has a bar in it, something like that, it's still a little different. It's not my norm. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. Other Otherwise, I don't want to be in a position where I'm used to having a beer right in front of me. It's not mine. And, you know, then I'm, it's just my normal activity. I'm not thinking about it. And then I do have a bad day or a really bad week or something mm. just catastrophic happens. And then I just say, fuck it. And I take that right. drink or, you know what I mean? I, I So I just mm-hmm. be careful with that kind of stuff. Uh, yeah. That's 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 the way. Yeah, that's in general the way I handle it. Is there do you um, here's a question. Are you ever uh, like just like enjoying a movie and then there'll be a scene and you're like, oh, fuck. And it just reminds you of like your thing or can you stay in the movie and stay on that character's experience? There's a couple things that make me uncomfortable. Like if I'm watching, which this is really funny and it's kind of a running joke between Victoria and I. She likes to watch like documentaries at night. I've told you guys that before. Things that'll be yeah. like boring and help her fall asleep. If we watch those shows like Drug Drugs Inc. or something, they're shows where they like follow the police, but then they also follow the criminals. And they'll be like in somebody's drug house and they're like, Yeah, we're cutting up this meth or whatever. You know, different drugs and they and they actually show that stuff. I feel kind of sick. And when I feel when I see people using drugs, it makes me feel just kind of sick and kind of dirty. It's it's a kind of a gross, uncomfortable feeling because it does mm-hmm. remind me of of that life that and that yeah. lifestyle. And that's not what and those you know, people. Yeah, and those people, man. You know, it's just there's there's just yeah. So it, it kind of grosses me out. That's so I do have like a reaction to specifically mm-hmm. those things. But if I'm watching a show like blow you know or like scarface and all the cokes on the table i'm like that's fucking you know he's got the machine gun and like he's a boss you know so well machine guns are involved they cancel out all the other yeah 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 i'm right there with you i'm right there with you for all that stuff but yeah like like vice vice will show like people that are just like hardcore like they'll show them abusing drugs and i'm just like oh that person's skin looks so bad and they're you know they're just thinking about all that it just it makes me feel a little nauseous so, yeah. so right. you're 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 actually that's a really great answer because it really makes a difference whether it's real or not. What do you mean? Yeah, because like oh, well, you can yeah. watch like a movie. You can watch like yeah. you know, you know, like yeah. a gangster movie, and it doesn't like creep you out. But we well, you know you watch too, a documentary. I'll different. say this: I I I changed a lot of my tastes. So when I was really into drugs, part of what I did was related to photography i explored like some really dark emotional stuff like my pictures were really dark and um a lot of that was like me kind of delving into this darkness and so like every winter i'd like crawl into this hole very emo let's put it that way you know yeah yeah and i was exploring that really deeply and when i got out of when i got into recovery I kind of was like, well, oh shit, I lost that, you know, like I can't be that anymore. And that was like my shtick, you know? Right. And and mm. so I gave up on some stuff that I used to enjoy, specifically music. Like I'll listen to stuff that's like dark, depressing music sometimes. And, and even nowadays, like I can listen to some Nirvana nowadays, but I can really relate to Kurt uh, in a lot of ways that I think a lot of people who aren't, who haven't been where I've been, uh, like I, I get it. I just, I feel him. And so for that reason, that's like, I don't want to entertain that. I don't want to put myself there. It's not like, yeah. it's like it's the same reason like Tony was talking to you. want to like be on social media and put himself into that negativity. So mm-hmm. like, I prefer to stay away from those things, you know? Right. Makes sense. Right. For sure. Huh. Interesting shit. Yeah. Yeah. Stuff we never it. talk about. But I'm happy. So did we, did we end the episode or start a new one? I don't know. I don't know what's happening. We didn't do anything. What day it is? We just moved the people around. And- <laughs> yeah. But I do need to turn a light on because I, it got rainy outside, and I was like, as I was watching it just get darker and darker in here, I was like, 
Oh well, we're not watching me anyways. It's fine. Well, let's <laughs> let's call let's call this the end of the first episode, and we'll change Perfect. our shirt. All right, yes. and we'll say like, share, subscribe, comment, and ring the bell one yes. more time. And we'll thank Mutant and remind everybody go on IamMutant.com and use a discount code Dusty Twenty or Big Ron Twenty and load up on shit. And uh, we appreciate Mutant support a lot. And also the Patreon page. Don't forget the Think Big Bodybuilding Patreon page. Every little bit of Patreon goes towards a good cause. I didn't even ask Ron to say that, and he started saying it. I appreciate it's that. Just, it's in his soul. Well, yeah. I mean, hey, you know, you do all you do a lot of work. You know, I was gonna say you do all the work, but you do like nah, like ninety six point five percent of the work. And uh, we <laughs> appreciate ninety nine. You're okay. the talent, though, Ron. You're the one. You're yeah. the talent. Without so, you. So 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 uh, so yeah. That was a good one. Let's go. Thank you. We're out. Change. Okay. <laughs>